Cara Payton, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thanks, Elliot. I am glad to hear and I'm excited to dive into our conversation today. For those who haven't come across yourself before, can you give the listeners a bit of context about who you are and what it is that you do? Absolutely. I like to think of myself as not necessarily a coach, not necessarily a the guru, not necessarily the answer or the main teacher, but somebody who actually goes side by side with them during a life inquiry or a self inquiry. Because most of the people, when they come to me, they come to me for something very specific on the surface. They are looking for an answer to saving their relationship, saving their work, finding out what's going on with their health or their mindset. They have a very, very tip of the iceberg thing. And that's usually not the case. It's usually nothing in the problem exists that we're actually, it's usually something underlying, something underneath the surface. And I want to help them go through a self-exploration that where I'm not showing them the answer. I'm not giving them the answer because how how silly would it be to sit there and provide answers to somebody? I don't have their life context. I don't have their experience. I don't know what they're going through. And I don't know the individuation of their thought process around it. So I like to go underneath into the subconscious and shine a flashlight on all of these areas because when you do that and you provide somebody the ability to see what's going on behind the curtain, usually they can figure out all of their answers. So I like to think of myself as a strategist, a subconscious strategist and an authenticity coach to help them find their truth by just pointing them in the right direction. So how do we go beneath the surface and tap into our subconscious? On a case-by-case individual basis, the common theme that I have found is that it's not an inability to have the right answer. It's a lack of skill in asking the right questions. And so I help them ask questions that we start with a main ring, super, super vague, broad brushstroke. They're getting very, very general. And usually their problems are very general at first. They think, well, my husband and I, we're not, we're not getting along very well. Okay, walk me back through a little bit more. Walk me back through a little bit more. Tell me about this area. Tell me about this area. Tell me about the habits and behaviors and patterns and things like that. And then by the time I've asked the question, we're getting to the root. And so we have our conscious thoughts. We have our conscious limiting beliefs, the ones that we know about above the surface. I want to get to the lumps under the rug, the things that live rent-free in the head, live rent-free in the home, live rent-free in the wallet, live rent-free in their health conditions that they're not looking at simply because it's one of those things that they have put a period on it, they've punctuated it as a statement, and they've just, they live with it. They've never brought it into question. They see it as an immovable part of their life. And all of these immovable parts of their lives, these are the structures. These are the things we're after. Because you can break apart any known thing all you want. But if it's something that you're constantly asking questions about, it's getting your focus. And chances are, not only is this problem becoming bigger because your focus is on it, but we're making a huge mess of something that is not even part of the problem itself. It's the outcome. And if we take a plant would be a perfect example. I plant some flowers. I overwater them. I'm overwatering them. So the root system is rotten. What we tend to do with our problems in our life is we go, why aren't the, why isn't the flower growing? Somebody help me with the flower. The flower here is not growing. I can't figure out that. So they're, this is our marriage. This is the state of our health. This is the repeated habits that we, we're attacking this. We attack the anxiety, but we're not going into the root system going, oh, I've overwatered it because we don't question anything about what we're doing at the root. And so I like to bring people down and go, hey, let's look at the root system. Let's follow this trail of anxiety all the way to the nervous system and find out what is going on under the surface. That's where the magic is. And when they can understand the questioning process I give them, they can self-apply it and they don't need me. And that's the beauty of it is I give them the tool structure to self-reference and then they go on their whole lives and they now have this questioning process that they can bring into for pretty much every single thing that they'll face from here on. Yeah, that's super, super powerful. And before we dive deeper on that, I want to touch on your personal journey. Is that what it looked like for you as well? Did you have to go down the route of digging for those answers and then ultimately found yourself at where you are today? Yes, I was basically burning out, burning the candle at both ends attacking the problem, attacking the problem, attacking the problem to the point where I felt like I was going insane. And I thought I was losing my 
of losing my life, losing my mind, losing control, losing grip. Everything felt like it was just sand flying through my fingers. It was like everything is being destroyed. I can't figure out where my destructive habits and patterns are. It was, my life became very quickly just this chaotic nightmare and I didn't want anything to do with it. And I ran away from it, essentially. I, I sold everything. I started fresh. I destroyed. And so having that physical destruction of the structure around me, I sold my home, sold the car, moved away, spent a month in Japan, completely blasted through all my familiar territory. And in my empty house, this empty, tiny little place that didn't have, I didn't have a possession to my name, that physical manifestation of the total destruction of the structures gave me that open canvas space to actually think about it on my own. Like, okay, there's nothing in my way. It was almost a physical representation of the questions that I would then be able to ask myself in that open space. And I was able to go, okay, what really, at the end of the day, what really was I doing or not doing? What is underneath all of this? Where are the whys? Where are the causes? And I got, unbeknownst to me, I made those questions. I thought it was just to apply to my life. I did not have any intention of being a coach, being a teacher, being an author, being a speaker, none of it. And if you would have told me, fast forward today, that this is the where my life would be, I, would have, I wouldn't have believed you, but I also probably would have laughed at you because it was so far from my bandwidth. I was, I was in the wedding industry, had no intention of leaving it. I was an artist. And every single thing that I brought myself through years and years ago now is the structure of what I teach other people. That's huge. And it's always super valuable when someone's gone through their own story. You never want the person who had the super smooth and easy ride to where they were giving you advice because you want the person who's gone through their own personal version of hell on earth and come out of it on the other side who recognizes what someone else could be going through. So I love that you've had that struggle that you went through. Obviously, we never want to go through it at the time, but when you reflect on it, usually nine times out of 10, or I'd say even maybe 9.5 times out of 10, most of us are grateful for it in the end, as long as we've come successfully through it. So now I want to transition onto those who are going successfully through it. You mentioned that, you know, there's so many of these people with these subconscious behaviors, patterns, and narratives. Is the reason why people live with those and believe those is because they as you mentioned, feel that they're immovable. They were placed on them. They haven't even given themselves a chance to question them. But I'm struggling to understand why, when it's so destructive, we still keep those in place. Why is that? We cannot see our own blind spots. And it's it's not even a matter of we understand that they're there and we refuse to look at them or we don't know that they are the cause. So it's similar to having a muscle pain that say it's in the middle of your back, but the connectivity of the muscles, it actually didn't, it's not in the middle of your back. It actually started way down. It's somewhere completely unrelated. And a chiropractor does this all the time. I, I don't know how many times I've gone to my chiropractor. I've been like, oh, I have something in my, the back of my neck. And he does something into my back that releases it. And like, but it was here. And he goes, eh, no, actually it wasn't. It was, yeah, the pain was there. That's where it showed up. But where it started, where it shows up and where it starts, it's often very, very different. If I have, for example, if I have a, if I do not take care of myself and I'm struggling with a health issue or a weight issue or some sort of uh, addiction to say sugar or cigarettes or alcohol or something like that, and it's outwardly affecting my my appearance my skin say maybe i'm eating something horrible and my skin is covered in rashes or eczema or, or blemishes and i have horrible acne or something i'm going to attack the acne typically and we have the beauty industry knows this they they sell you all different kinds of creams and potions and elixirs and serums and all of that to take care of this but what they're not addressing is the fact that this person has a horrible sense of self-worth and doesn't eat live foods they don't eat whole foods. They don't eat things that are healthy. They made, they eat man-made manufactured food-like substances. It's not real food. And so when you put that into your body, your body doesn't know what to do with it. And it forms these rogue cells and, and these um, outliers in, and it all comes out in different ways. It could come out as a gut issue. It could come out as skin issue. It could come out as brain fog. It come, and it's, there's so many different ways. We attack the outcome. But we're often 
not diving into the root cause. So I don't think it's any type. I think that people that want to change, they genuinely do want to change. I think that somebody who's struggling with their weight genuinely doesn't want to struggle with their weight. They either want to, and that's where I think the body positivity movement came in. They either want to accept themselves as they are in all of those extra pounds or whatever. They're like, I'm going to, I'm going to start loving myself. I think it initially started with, I'm going to get rid of this weight. And when it didn't go anywhere, they're like, well, I've, I, I just need to accept it. And so we've moved into a place where I think it's more positive because in that resistance, we're going to continue to make the problem worse. So I think the body positivity movement will actually move us into a place where now from a place of love, I didn't go to the gym with self-loathing. I went to the jo- the gym with self-love. I'm going to take care of myself. That's going to actually attack the root of any of those issues, which is self-worth. Our health is a direct reflection of our self-worth. So In a long-winded way of getting around to the answer, I think it's just because these things, they're not being questioned because they're not even being seen. They're looking at the root, the tip of the iceberg, not looking at anywhere underneath the surface. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's why things like, you know, weight loss injections, for example, are great in the short term, but terrible in the long term, because ultimately weight loss and maintaining a good body composition comes down to habits and lifestyle. And during the process of just getting that off yourself isn't going to allow that to stick on the long term. It might for, you know, 5% of people, but for the other 95%, they need to learn how to reshape their relationship with food themselves and ultimately get to a stage where they can have a healthy relationship with both of those things ultimately to keep them. So yeah, I completely can see where you're coming from with that perspective. And then in terms of now asking those questions and seeing those blind spots, where do we start there? Do we need someone to take us through that to get us that ask the right questions because I'm sure a lot of people think, well, I might ask myself a few questions, but I can't see it being the root to all of my problems. And that is anybody that does say that, I would say yes, finding somebody that can help you ask those questions is paramount, is key because they can ask you questions that your brain wants to self-preserve. It wants you to stay comfortable. It wants the familiar. So any type of line of questioning that's going to get you to maybe come outside of that, your brain's going to avoid at all cost, And it's not even going to permit you to ask that question, let alone answer it, and let alone answer it honestly. Because there's a lot of times that I can ask somebody pointed questions about their about their past, about their previous relationship, about any of their patterns, and they're gonna go right into the narrative of anything that avoids any type of mirror. And that is where somebody else can be key. Because to to do that to yourself, even I find myself after six, seven years of doing this relentlessly, I find myself kind of buying my own BS and getting myself to do the stall tactics and everything. And I have to understand that my brain is this computation device that is absolutely brilliant if I use it as a tool, but oftentimes it tries to use me as a tool to self-preserve, to get to stay in comfort. And to back up to what you were saying about habits and lifestyle with somebody, for example, with a weight issue or somebody with a just a health issue in general, and it translates to weight, but it also translates to lack of energy, it translates to sore joints, it translates to all sorts of things, proneness to injury. It's also habits, lifestyle, but those two things inform our identity. And that's the real, the real shift that we have to make. It's not just habits and lifestyle because habits and lifestyle with an old identity are forced. And you, you see it all the time with people like, I'm trying to start a new habit. And they're gripping, clawing at the walls. They're like, I hate this. They hate it because they have the old identity of themselves that they are just, they're the smoker that tried to quit smoking. They're the fat girl who's trying to get in shape. They're, they're the old identity trying to do something new. They're the addicted forcing themselves not to have, if they change the identity part, to going from a smoker who quit smoking to a non-smoker. That shift in language, it sounds so bogus and small, but it really is the difference maker. If I were to tell myself I'm going to work out five days a week, I'm going to work out five days a week. I've done this so many times to myself, Elliot. It is, it, I could be a stand-up comedian with all the stories I've told myself inside my head about, I'm going to go to the gym five times this week. If I were to say I'm an athlete and that's just what I do, there's something in it that becomes not a forced habit. Like it's just, no, it's just what I do. So we have to decide in any of these cases who we're going to be, this new identity, who I am. My friend Cody Jefferson talks about this beautifully. He does not, 
make all these choices about his day, about his life, about his wallet, about his time. None of those things get, get decided from just a random, obscure place. He decided who he was going to be, who he was going to be, what he was going to be known for, how his family was going to perceive him, how he wanted his family to remember him. And he reversed engineer, okay, then from that identity, what does that say I want? And then what does that say I do? And then what does it say I say? What does that say? I mean, it just, he'd reversed engineered all of that from an identity perspective. And I actually shifted that recently and, and used his model. Because I was like, what do I want? And I could answer that. Well, I, I want a nice house. I want to be able to travel with my sons. I want to be a national best-selling author. I want, and it was just, we do that in stapling pipe dreams to random clouds. It's aimless, it's foundationless, and it's not based and rooted in something. It's just me trying to go after these summits and these goals. And how often do we see that the setup in the world? It's like, chase your dreams, follow your goals. Well, if you pin that random thing to a cloud and it floats on by, you're constantly chasing. You're constantly running up every mountain, going down every trench, trying to fight and scrap your way through this goal. How much more stabilized would it be if you made it embedded in who you are and practice that identity of who you are, who you are going to be, how are you going to show up in your day? Staple it to that, embed it in that, solidify that, you don't have a lot of questions after that as far as what you're going to do with your day, what you're going to do with your time, what you're going to do with your money. Your gambling habit, if you've become somebody who's oriented with the bigger picture and is not instant gratification motivated anymore, that man doesn't gamble anymore. He doesn't have that identity anymore. He doesn't gamble because he's not careless. If that man has a sense of self-worth and he trusts himself and he has his own back and he believes in what he can create, he doesn't gamble anymore. Even if he was addicted, that's just not a part of who he is. And it's just practice of that. We talk about habits all the time, but habits are not this mystery machine. We so have made habits this crazy process of like 10 days to this. How long does it take to form a habit? 21 days, seven weeks, three years. I don't know. A habit is nothing more than a process, a function, or anything done until memorized, repeated until memorized. How long does that take? Depends on the habit, depends on the person, depends on the practice. It's not a machine. Practice your identity as a habit until memorized. Literally the biggest game changer there is. I love that identity piece. And I think it's so, so valuable. And also then once you start to ask yourself, well, what do I truly want? And what does that require? It also comes in with values as well, because ultimately when you start to talk about the person who's not a gambler or in my industry, once again, who is a healthy individual, that person is no longer careless with what they put into their body. They're intentional about their exercise. And as you mentioned, it depends on the goals, but right, you don't have to say you're an athlete. You just have to say, I'm a recreational gym goer. I am someone who values their health and wants to live to see my grandchildren grow old. And therefore yes. these actions, these habits and all these different types of things are required in order to get me there. And I think that that's maybe the biggest piece that's missing of the puzzle is that so many of us don't recognize that the seed that we're planting today is ultimately the seed that's going to grow in the future. And I think that there's that disconnect between, okay, well, you know, if I eat the burger today, it doesn't really have a big difference. But if I eat the burger every day in 20 years time, then it might have a little bit of a, an impact downstream, essentially. And the thing that I want to ask now, there's two questions I've got here. The first is, how do we know ultimately if the path that we are traveling is ultimately the one that we want to go down, how do we know that we are the athlete or the person who just wants to accept themselves at 20 kilos, quote unquote, overweight, scientifically speaking? And also, once we've done that, how do we get the strength to keep doing those things? Yes, it's something that is integrated into our goals and our desires and everything along those lines, but it doesn't make it easy. So that's two parts of the question. The first is, how do we know that what we're doing is exactly what we genuinely want and not what we've been told? And it's not another message and narrative from our childhood potentially. And the second aspect is once we've defined that, how do we then keep on going and keep on going and doing the things that required to ultimately get and become who we want to be and what we want to achieve? That's a beautiful question. And I actually have a very different answer than 
perhaps you're expecting. My first answer initially is that you really won't. You won't know. And we have to kind of make peace with that because there are incremental things that we've been told over time in society that have worn a program so deep to kind of undo all of that is going to take a lot of time. And I'm learning this very, so the second part of the question is we have to practice a habit of authenticity, a quest, a line of authenticity, finding out our soul truth, our truest, truest truth. And every single day there's an onion layer of what is untrue or what is what has been learned but is not authentic to us. What we've done in the process of our lives, trying to belong, fit in, get the job, get the marriage, we have kind of, it's a death by a thousand cuts to our true inherent souls that cause us to look for all these answers outside of us that started at a very, very young age. There was an invitation at some point or another, usually by our parents or our siblings or our first initial friends of do I want to belong in this situation? Do I want to be accepted in this situation? Do I want to be loved in this situation? And there was a micro negotiation that was made to abandon yourself, abandon a part of yourself, abandon a part of your truth, or kind of just shave or sand off an edge of something that is true to you in order to make yourself more palatable for other people. We did this very, very early. And at first it wasn't malicious necessarily toward ourselves, but it was just you know, I think it would just be easier to connect with this person if I had to let a little bit of this part of myself just not come into the fold, just hide it away. But over time, this negotiation process gets easier to make. We're like, oh, well, that worked before. I have this connection. I have these friends. I have this group. I have this job. And, and I take that, take another part of myself. And I just, eh, you know, it's, it's going to be so much easier to conform in this situation than it will be to hold a standard, hold a value, hold a boundary, hold an opinion, hold a truth about me. I, we were, we're born, we're built for connection. We're built to be loved and accepted and find rapport and find family and find belonging. It's, it's in our DNA. It's just like that humanity is not, we're not islands. We're meant to be tribal and group and, and, formed together and we're made for those bonds. So it's a it's a process that starts based on the way that we're designed, but it, it gets way out of control based on society, especially with any narrative, any subject, any part of our world, any part of our lives. There is what we truly want and there's what the world says that we should want. And we're constantly trading and exchanging both of these and more often than not, you get to our 30s and 40s, we have negotiated away, to, negotiated away more of, our, of this side of our truth and, and exchanged it for something we think we want in the world. I do not think at all that the social media feeds and the headline news and what's on TV and in pop culture and society and all of that, I don't think that that's even a fraction of a single percent of what is honest about us and what we really want. I think we're all Post Malone's lying in wait. We have so many different kinds of music, so many different kinds of art, so many different kinds of personal appearances and personalities and beautiful poems and books to be written and just crazy interesting hobbies. And there's so many different fragments of the world that are completely undiscovered because they fall so far outside the lines. They're so far outside the norm. They're such outliers. And maybe we'll get there, but it requires a total abandon of the status quo. Slowly and incrementally in every single question we ask ourselves, at the end of the night, I sit and reflect before I go to bed. Okay, now what could be even truer than this tomorrow? Well, how can I show up as an even truer version of myself tomorrow? What could be even truer than this true? And it's it's a process. It's a lifelong process. And so as far as that in a, how do I know what I want? It's becoming, it's becoming formed every single day. It's becoming formed and unformed every single day. It's a process. It's a process. And then, you know, to answer the second question, as I shape and reshape that version of myself, there is a inauthenticity in truth. There is a freedom 
that compels you forward at a rate that motivation can't touch. I used to, I think the lack of motivation and the lack of energy we have to chase after these habits, to chase after these goals, to chase after these dreams, I think if we have to motivate ourselves and we have to get ourselves to do it, that's the biggest indicator right there that it's not our want, that it's not our dream, that it's not our goal. Because the more that I have tapped into what I actually want and who I actually am and peeled away those layers, that fire from inside throws me, pitches me eons beyond motivation ever could. So I think that's the biggest indicator. If you don't want to get out of bed and you don't care and you have to get yourself amped up and ramped up and motivated, you're going after the wrong bullseye. Do you think that's always the case? Because I think that can be very deceptive in the sense that sometimes it's so many different things going on in our life. Maybe our health is in a terrible place. Maybe we've got anxiety and depression and all these different types of things that we've just kind of lost the joy for the things that we genuinely enjoy. Maybe we do really want to spend a lot of time with our partner. We're just so stressed about paying the bills and succeeding and climbing this ladder and you know paying off our car payment and all these types of things. Maybe we do want to go down the route of doing that passion project, but we have so many different responsibilities that kind of take over. So there might be that passion there, but I feel like it might just be a flickering flame because there's so many things on top of you. I quite often ask a lot of people on their health and fitness journey. I'm like, if I took away the majority of stress from your life, from the responsibilities you do at work and, you know, the looking after the kids and all this stuff would you be motivated and excited to get out and work out today most of them would say yes so do you think it's always the case or do you think sometimes it's just crowded and kind of shoved in the corner because we have so many of other responsibilities and obligations that actually kind of dim that light versus letting it actually burn bright the way it could and should hypothetically yes but mostly no because it's all mental masturbation as far as when we ask it if i removed all your stress what would you do with it it's like well <laughs> like that's they're speaking as a presupposition they think you know people that are dirt poor can't rub two nickels together at the end of the month because they've just they've spent themselves raw you give them you give them an opportunity to have a million dollars and you know people that win the lottery that are broke or what people that play the lottery are usually broke and they end up broke or bankrupt within a certain amount of time. It's because the identity doesn't change. And we can say all day, if you take money stress out of it, well, it's like, if you're not the type of person to save a dollar out of 10, you're not the person to save 10 out of a hundred. And you're definitely not the person to save a hundred out of a thousand or a thousand out of 10,000 or a 10,000 out of a, a you know, a hundred thousand. If you won't do it with a little and you won't you know, carve your line in the sand with who you are, what you want, what you stand for, what you're going after with a little bit, you know, the rest of it's just, oh, well, if I had, and we hold ourselves to this, if I had, if I had, if I had all day long, and that's exactly where your brain wants you. Because in that you will be addicted to the familiar and you will not. And so while it's nice to say, I'd like to spend more time with my partner, but if you really wanted to spend time with your partner, there are some serious identity questions and some serious honesties that are due to yourself and to your partner that would clear the stuff that is bogged down on top of us. Because I, and I, I don't not empathize because there were so many times I'm just like, why can't I, why can't I? And this learned helplessness, this addiction to the familiar so often was then gripped hands around my neck. And it was me. It was self-inflicted. I was addicted to the habit. I was addicted to the comfort of the discomfort. And I wasn't being honest with myself. And so again, authenticity, the truth will set you free. When you know you're a lazy ass, you will actually start, okay, I've said that I, oh, I just want to spend time with my partner. But in reality, I'm a really crappy partner. And if you just let that land and let that sense of self-accountability just land, like, where is this going to take me? If I continue, this is what I'm doing. This represents who I am. If you want to dissect anybody by what's prior, what, by what their priorities are, especially when it comes to like financials or, you know, somebody who's overwhelmed, look at their time and look at their bank statements. And that will tell me what your priorities are. And those don't lie. We can lie to ourselves. I want to be a good partner. Okay. Look at your bank statements at the last time you did anything, spent anything, invested anything in your partner. Look at your calendar the last time you did anything, spent anything, invested anything in your partner. That will tell me whether that is, oh, it's a pipe dream. It's total BS. I want to be a good partner. No, you don't. I'm looking at two things right here that show you have zero desire, zero initiative, zero habits, zero practices that show you want to be a good partner. And they're not based in 
identity. There are things you just pin to the cloud and let them float away, having no control over them. So yes and no, there's a caveat. There's a certain amount of harsh honesty, but there's also like, here's the true explanation of why we get caught in there. It's it's our brain, it's our habits, it's our addictions to this like, this feels gross and warm and a familiar slosh of sick familiarness. That's our design. That's what we're fighting against. And yes, it sucks. And yes, it's really, really hard. But we have absolute control over directed thought. That is the one thing God gave us. It's the one thing the universe instilled humanity with is the ability to direct, to direct our own thoughts. If we direct them toward honesty, really nothing, authenticity and truth, you know, even, even John 8, 32 says that the truth will set you free. The second part of that is the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And that radical honesty part is enormous. And I think that you're absolutely right is that we get caught in these self-inflicted traps in the sense of saying, okay, well, I want to be a better partner, but the partner ideal in my mind is, I don't know, this Disney prince or this person who takes his partner to the Maldives every six months. And then we're like, well, we can't possibly reach that. So there's nothing I can possibly do. And then we end up getting caught in that trap because of the ceiling seems so high and I'm never going to reach that. So I may as well not try and do anything at all. Whereas actually, if you reflect and you ask yourself, okay, well, if I had a five minute conversation where I looked into my partner's eyes and I spoke to them and asked them about how they were, would that make me a better partner today? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. And I'm pretty damn sure that you can find five minutes in your day. So as you mentioned, it does come back to that radical honesty, kind of getting out of your self-inflicted trap. And yeah, I really like that caveat that you went down on that, that route that you went down because it did take us back to the honesty and also kind of these illusions that we create for ourselves that ultimately keep us trapped in a comfort zone that actually isn't really that comfortable we just have to get super real with ourselves and transitioning back onto the authenticity part it's very paradoxical because of when we see the person who has the pink hair the face tattoos who's really out there and they have status we then all of a sudden say well this guy's cool you know this guy's an awesome performer they're incredible Whereas when it's the friend in the social group who hasn't got that much status, we're like, well, he's weird, he's unusual, she's different, and we don't like the way they are. So it's really unusual that, you know, realistically, when it comes to authenticity, it's only if it's kind of accepted by enough people, then it gets fashionable and cool, right? So in terms of that authenticity side of things, without status, if we're someone who's just kind of operating in our social group, who doesn't want to be thrown out by our community and the people we love, but we do want to follow that path of being us, how do we really embrace our authenticity without removing every single person in our life and removing everything that was normal to us in the past? That's a great question and definitely a qualifier for anybody's willingness to seek a more authentic path for sure. And there's a lot of stories that we pre- suppose when we go into that process is that we're going to, just like you said, we're going to, if we don't want to lose everyone and lose everything we've ever known. Well, the trade-off is we are going to lose people. We are going to lose a degree of comfort because that, that whole, that whole motivator about why we were able and willing to sell part of our souls slowly but surely was to ensure the comfort and insurance that people would approve of us, accept us, love us, etc. And we're going to have to except a, a small amount of discomfort. But the thing is, it's almost like when you are authentic all the way, there's this first initial sting. And yeah, there are, so, you know, I lost probably, I've lost probably maybe 10 people in my life that were super important at the time at the cost of me having peace with who I am behind them in the privacy of my own four walls, me being able to go, who I am here is who I am out there. And that that coherence provides an inner peace that cannot be understated. That freedom, that feel good, there's nothing that will ever be valued to me more than that self-honesty. The other flip side of it is we have discomfort in being a little bit less of who we are, or maybe not even who we are, to have this false sense of security with our friendships and whatnot, but it's all based on BS. We only reason we have these friend groups, the only reason we have this is because we've made this weird negotiation process that like only so much of us is allowed. And deep down, we know that. Deep down, we know that I've secured these friendships because they don't know who I really am. 
And so it's like a, it's not the initial sting and not the initial break. And it's not the bandaid pull that's like, Ooh, Oh God, that's, that really, really feels we, we catastrophize what it's like in, to be honest with ourselves and honest with everybody about who we are. But the slow burn, the sn- slow nag, the deep dig of that dishonesty over time, knowing that everything we've built our lives upon is rubbish. That pain, first of all, that pain doesn't ever go away. The pain of authenticity does go away over time and it becomes bliss. On the other side of it becomes absolute freedom and bliss. This doesn't ever go away and it slowly nags at you. This dishonesty nags at you over and over and over because your inner being, your true highest sense of potential and pure self knows and wants to continuously call you out. So not only are you going to have the pain of knowing that everything that you've built is on singing sand, it's BS, but you have the conflict that your inner being, your highest self is constantly going to pose and remind you that you are completely gaslighting everyone around you and yourself, that this is the acceptable way to live. And so for anyone struggling with that, that doesn't have that deep key motivator about, okay, well, I am going to lose people. It's like, yes, but how awful has it been to slowly but surely lose yourself in the process? And I, to be totally and completely transparent, I did this for over 30 years because I wanted a father's approval and I wanted a relationship to maintain itself. I wanted to fit in with groups. I wanted to be easy to accept and easy to understand by my family, by the friends, by the world. And I sold myself out every single day in some micro way. I mirrored people. I I copied and I I fit in and I just, it was rinse and repeat day in and day out. I did that for 30 years. And my depression, my anxiety, my dis-ease, my total just inability to be alone, alone with my thoughts and be at ease led me to the point of, honestly, all the way to suicidal ideation. I was such a shell of myself that there was really nothing left to get me to want to participate in life, in this game. It was like this game, this game sucks. The people suck. Everything about this world and the way I'm living sucks. And it, over time, that dishonesty shapes and changes your lens of the world. You think you want connection, but over time, that dishonesty with yourself, it makes that impossible. It's like a, a dilation of that connection, it just becomes further and further, that dissonance becomes so far away. As we perceive and as we participate in this dishonesty process, the closer we can get to somebody over time becomes even further away. It's, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle and it has to stop. If, if anybody hopes to have true inner peace, clarity, freedom, energy, anything in their life worth living, And then to just, I don't know, guess to to love yourself, to have, to know you have your own back, to have that confidence. And confidence is nothing more than keeping your promise to yourself, having your own back. So it's, it's not a, there's no other way around it. It's not a, it's not a feel good process, but it is, it is the key. It's the catalyst for personal freedom and confidence. Yeah, absolutely. It's stepping out of the certainty, the familiar, but once again, it all comes down to the fact that it's just a trap that you've essentially put yourself in and for good reason too like you said we're wired for connection we're wired for acceptance and love and unfortunately there was a lot of that subconscious programming when we were younger and made us realize that there were certain ways in which we got love and attention and they manifested into our teenage years and our late teenage years and our early 20s and then only you know, once in a while, maybe it's a bit of a psychological trip, or maybe it's a deep uh, dive of depression or anxiety, do we ever force ourselves to be actually starting to question like, well, was this the right path? Do I feel anything like myself? You hear so many people say like, I just looked in the mirror, or I just stood in my own body, and I didn't recognize who I was. And I think that it's just that constant narrative of just like creating the person who is like you mentioned, socially acceptable, who is able to conform, who is able to fit in. And then all of a sudden, they end up having this identity crisis. And I think, yeah, it's it's a big thing that a lot of people go through. And I'm not going to ask you the question of how you get yourself out of that hole. I'm more interested in when someone gets to the place where they've recognized this, they've taken the steps to move forward, 
How do they hold themselves accountable to the truth, to authenticity, to ensure that they really instill this version of themselves that they truly are and truly want to be? Well, I think there is a buffer period where it has to be accepted that you you will, it's, it's a lifelong habit to have done the opposite. And so there needs to be a buffer period of significant grace along the way that you're going to one day, you're going to wake up and go, I can't, I've, I've reached my threshold for today. I need to, I need to go back to the familiar. I need to go back to what feels good. There's going to be a few times where you're going to do that and fall face first in the reverse direction. I, I was no exception. I did, I did that. I wanted to go back to the relationship that wouldn't accept me for who I could not, could not at all tolerate who I really was and, and almost made that very clear in the over domineering kind of negotiation process of he could be whoever he wanted to be, but I had to constantly compromise that. I had a lot of relationships because like attracts like, I couldn't be myself and I was willing to negotiate who I was. So I attracted a lot of people that demanded that I negotiate who I was and compromise my values, compromise my identity, compromise myself. So there's a lot of people around you in this process that because you've compromised who you are, you've built a world, you've built friendship groups, you've built a, a workplace situation, you've built a lot of things that actually keep that structure in place. So you have so many disadvantages, not only with yourself and your own design to be magnetized back to comfort and familiar, but you have a world and a total environment because anytime we're looking at habits and our lifestyle and the way that it, it has come to fruition as it is in its current state, we have habits, relationships, and environment that all inform that. So if I have habits and relationship environment that all inform me compromising myself, I I still live in these things. I still I'm breaking habits which feels daunting at first. Relationships to let go of any of those feels incredibly hard at first. To change our environment, that's really the only starting point that really gives us any because we have to a certain degree in our own homes and things like that, we have control of our environment. That's really the first catalyst key, but our relationships, that's, you have 50% of the workload and the other person does too. And so a lot of our relationships, they're kind of like, they're not in our control. We can set boundaries, but boundaries have a misnomer right there off the gate because a boundary is not for other people. A boundary is a code of code of conduct you will hold yourself to. It's, it's my own government system, my boundaries. These are my rules of engagement for me. We often say it's a boundary for others. I'm creating a, that's, that's a guard. Don't get it twisted. If you're creating a boundary for someone else, you're closing a door between, you're giving them a fence line. That's not a boundary. <laughs> That is you holding a guard up. The habits as the last key is something, yeah, we have control over, but we have a lot of things. It's swimming upstream at first. So initially, yeah, there's there's going to be so many moments where all three of those, I want to say structures that we've built are all demanding that you compromise yourself. And I would say a daily self-inquiry practice, a daily honesty tool that you can do to bookend your day, maybe in the beginning of the day or the end of the night, before you go to sleep, before you wake up. Because if you do it before you go to bed, you put your subconscious to work on it, which is brilliant. And if you do it in the middle of, if you do it in the morning, you program yourself. So we have programming and then subconscious programming, conscious and subconscious, all working together toward that. And I actually created a tool on my website for people if they want to do a daily inquiry practice. It's a breath work practice that helps release emotional addictions, wake up with clarity, have the energy, have the drive, have the focus to become their authentic self, to create a life they love. And it's just small incremental. It's 15 minutes long. And somebody can do it first thing in the morning to get them just kind of, who do I want to show up today as? Who do I want to show up today as? Just small increment. My One of my best friends, Ken Jocelyn, says, incremental, not monumental. And just like you're saying, if it's not a weekend or it's not a every, the Maldives every six months, it's not worth having. Incremental changes. Brian Covey even also talks about this. The 1% every single day really does change the trajectory. It makes the world of difference. And so if you can do that and get yourself understanding that if you have your outcome stapled to the end finish line and you are taking 1% steps toward that every single day, you can't not get there. Just don't go backwards and don't stop. Keep your outcome where it is and keep focused on the 1%. You will get there. That's 
just the way it is. I love this. I really do. And in terms of more practical strategies that you have, you have that reflection point at the start of the day and the end of the day. Are there any things that you attribute to your success in terms of those daily practices, those things that really help you up level yourself in regards to your authenticity and ultimately living your truth and your best self? Absolutely. I give myself the freedom to choose again in any moment. I give myself that love and that self grace. I even physically put my hands around if I'm noticing that I'm getting wigged out or I'm having a situation where I'm starting to feel lost or disconnected from and I'm I'm noticing I'm kind of going backward in that dread, that anxiety, that panic of oh god, oh, I'm getting overwhelmed, I'm getting stressed, I'm getting I'm getting lost, I'm off track. I just and you can choose again. I choose to choose again. And I just reset. And there's there's times I do that 20, 30 times a day where it's like, Kara, just choose again. And it's not, I have done it 20, 30 times six years ago, and now I only do it twice a day. There are still times where I have to go, that conversation was brutal. It looks like I'm going to lose another friend. It looks like I'm not going to gain that client. It looks like I'm going to miss that opportunity because I had to choose to be me or choose to have the opportunity. And I chose me and it doesn't feel good. I want to choose the opportunity. I have to still to this day, just go, and you have the right to choose again. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to choose again. And because I have a meditation practice, meditation just means to become familiar with for anybody who doesn't meditate. They're like, Oh, God, she's a meditator. Anybody can meditate. Meditation is for everyone. And meditation is pretty much the answer to everything. I because I have that practice of self familiarity, and that inner dialogue that I know me, and I know how to talk to me. And I know how to relate to me. I know how to love me. I know how to work around me. A lot of times our blind spots are because we don't ever meditate on ourselves. And so that relationship with myself in meditation gives me the constant opportunity to go, remember, remember that, that place of bliss. Remember that place of happiness. And you can go back to it at any point. Nothing can keep you from it. It is a free ability to step right into it in any moment. And I've moved into it and moved into that practice so far that there are days when I can forget and hours where I can forget. And I just, even if I don't feel it's like, but I can choose again and I'm going to choose again. And I release the resistance. I release the stuff in between because it's that stuff, the resistance in our, it's mental construct. It's, it's dust. It's wisp. It's nothing. Nothing actually holds us to an old identity, an old habit, an old belief system. It's just, beliefs are just a thought you keep thinking. And when you know that, and you can have that detachment from it. You're like, oh yeah, I'm not tethered to this. I'm not a tree. I can move. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's super insightful. And the one question I have to ask you before we start to wrap up is, what are we getting wrong with the self-development practices that are constantly being spouted out. I feel like a lot of the ideas that we've discussed today, some of the philosophies that you've gone through and the idea of authenticity and identity are maybe not spoken about enough, but there's a lot about habits, there's a lot about motivation. What are we getting wrong from that perspective in terms of the world of personal development and life coaching and all those type of things? That somebody else holds the key. When we are seeking personal development, self-development, there's a very big word that we're missing right in the front of that self. Nobody else has your answer. Nothing out there, no book, no retreat, no workshop, no nothing out there is going to give you the missing piece. The missing piece is you. You may need a coach or a trainer or a, an, you may need a book that helps you to find you that can guide you back to yourself, that can help you self-reference. But ultimately the answer isn't out there. The key isn't out there. The habit isn't out there. The missing component that's gonna change everything, that's gonna make you feel whole, make you feel enough, make you feel like that doesn't exist. It's in you. And the, to the degree of suffering you will experience is the degree that you will chase after something out there. When you stop, and you let yourself just frickin' drop it all, that, it feels a little rebellious, it feels a little anti, you know, as far as the way we've structured everything, it feels like very anti-authority and very anarchist in, in <laughs> the rules that we've kind of, the unspoken rules we've created about how to do life as a population. When you just let go of it all, you find it. And that it is, it's you, you're the magic, you're the pill, you're the workshop, you're the retreat, you're the guru that you've always needed. And self-development, I still think is structured as somebody that's living a laptop lifestyle, 
standing at the top of a mountain, pitching knowledge and wisdom and success and how to's and you know, all of that stuff. They're pitching it from their mountain, their wants, their desires, their goals. And they're giving you all the metrics. They're selling you a total lie that when you get to the top of their mountain, it'll all make sense. And for some of us, we go by the subject matter of each coach, what, what they're teaching, how to make more money, how to sell your whatever, how to get rock hard abs in 10 days, how to, we, we seek them out. The, the YouTube searches, the Google searches are these individual mountains. And then you find somebody at the top of the mountain that you choose. Oh, that's my person. That, they're going to teach me how to figure myself out. Well, no, <laughs> there's a lot of false presuppositions there. They're going to tell you how to get to the top of their mountain. And you're going to spend $5,000, $2,000, $10,000, $100,000 to get to the top of that summit and realize, oh shit, that wasn't, that wasn't mine. That's not what I want. And you're empty again. So you trudge your way back down to the bottom and you Google another mountain. And it wouldn't it be so much more time saving and money saving if we stopped Googling how to get to the, how to live our lives and how to get to the top of other people's mountain, find out what yours is and then hire somebody that can inform you how to get to the top of yours, how to get to the center of you. That coach, I'll hire and follow all day long. I love that. What a great note to finish on. Ankara, I have a couple of final questions for you. And the first I have is, what impact do you want to have on the world with the work that you do? I would love to end mental and emotional suffering for people, for humanity. If I could make a huge dent in the amount of self-inflicted suffering that we put ourselves through. I would consider my life well lived. Beautiful answer. And where's the best place for people to find you if they want to keep up with the work that you're doing? My website is a fantastic place. It's actually getting a revamp to be even more of a place for connection, conversation, intimacy, intimate conversations and whatnot. And that's carapayton.com. But if they want a little bit more of a day-to-day, -day, an insight to my bad humor and Harry Potter addiction, I'm on Instagram <laughs> at carapayton. And there's a tiny underscore at the end of my name on Instagram, but it's just carapayton. Carapayton everywhere on social media. If you're on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, I'm everywhere, but Instagram's where I tend to be a little bit more frequent. I'll put all that in the show notes below. But Kara, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a super insightful and valuable conversation. Thank you for having me.